Hey friends, Kim here. And before we get into today's episode, I want to take a minute to talk about community. Proverbs 27, 4 says that sweet friendships refresh the soul and awaken our hearts with joy. Getting plugged into your local church is a great way to discover the refreshment of friendship with people who will build your walk with Jesus. If you're in the West Texas area, I personally want to invite you to visit tfc.org slash groups and find a group of people to do life with near you. So Daniel's here with us today. Hey, hey Daniel, welcome, welcome back. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome, Glad to Daniel. be here. When frankly, last time y'all made fun of me because when he was here, <laughs> I was last time I was just a little bit hot. We were real close together. <laughs> we were real close together. It was a little junior high. I mean, it was a little, it was just a little junior high. It was adorable. I love well, it. Well, and I just froze like I was in junior high with my arm around me and I fell asleep. Yeah, exactly. In a paralyzed position. We're sweating. We can't feel our fingers. I'm like extra gil- giddy or giggly. Yeah. Giggly. We have ourselves together today. You I'm so glad. You are so mature. Thank you. Yes, we are very mature. Um, I also have to point out that the three of you guys are wearing the black t-shirt uniform. Yes, hey, exactly. This we, is the uniform. We are in uniform. Mm-hmm. And Bree, I'm you are, you out of are the standout. And I am the standout. Yes, you are. Thank you. Happy for to be the some variety. Yes. <laughs> so we're happy to be with you guys today. Yeah, we're glad you're here. We're so glad. I think we should also talk about this just kind of recent new couples connection that the four of us have, which oh, is come on. centered around pickleball. Come on. I love pickleball. Right? I played oh twice, but I love it. <laughs> telling you, it is... Well, so, I love that you would say it's a connection. So thank you. <laughs> I keep saying you got to teach us how to play. Yes. So we're going to have to go together oh so y'all can gosh. instruct us. It's some fun com- new common ground. So, but you should, I think you should probably explain a little bit what pickleball is because apparently it is a growing sport. Fastest. Pickleball, the fastest growing fastest sport, sport. Mm-hmm. but it's still not super widely known. So okay. we should take a moment. To and to hear from ball. the expert. I don't know. <laughs> the expert pickleball Okay, do you wear a player. glove when you play, Daniel? I do not. Okay, Okay. Good. well. Do you have pickleball <laughs> shoes? I have outdoor shoes, yes. Okay. Well, we purchased for pickleball. <laughs> exclusively we for have pickleball. Some in the okay. shopping yes. cart. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're trying to figure out what the level of gear we got we to gotta get up on. <laughs> yeah. oh, uh, we did notice that our pickleball paddles have somebody playing guitar on them, which makes no sense whatsoever. So we're kind of embarrassed to be playing very, with those. They're, so. the, they're the recreational sort. <laughs> okay. That well, that's Daniel why, that's did why I, recommend well, to us. Well, I asked the series of questions. What, where, what are we? Are we? Are we in tra- Are we gonna? <laughs> are we gonna get serious? Is there's there's levels to the paddle and. <laughs> <laughs> Truthfully, um, depending on how serious you want to get, it can get real serious in price. Okay. Well, so we didn't buy the two hundred and fifty dollars paddles, no. but we should just share. Okay, so you started playing pickleball last I mean, summer. Last summer, pickleball is it's. I mean, it's kind of like a cross between like ping pong and tennis with a wiffle ball. With a wiffle ball. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. You're standing on the basically on the table and playing ping pong. And playing ping pong yes. with, with a big the, ball. Big ball and a big paddle. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> it makes it pretty fun and pretty yes. simple. It is pretty simple. Not it very is. fast. Yes. So unless Jimmy tries one of his fancy racquetball shots and I'm like, <laughs> you're like, if that's you a power want shot. me <laughs> to keep playing with you, you cannot no. do that. <laughs> We've had a similar experience. Yes, we oh, have. Oh, well, okay. I, I am learning. You are the expert. That's not fair. <laughs> but it was so funny the day that that you guys texted us asking about you know um like if we're gonna play pickleball like what equipment do you recommend i think we were driving somewhere whenever i got that text and i just burst out laughing because i really was like oh get ready you have no idea <laughs> what kind of door you just here opened. comes all the information <laughs> Yes. Okay. Well, you know, I'm, both of you know how my brain works. So once I get into something, I dive to the dredges <laughs> of it. So that's why all the question is like, well, what kind of net do you want? How expensive a paddle do you want? Do you want shoes? Do you not want shoes? What color of outdoor ball do you want? Are you going to play indoor? And they're different too. Mm-hmm. The indoor and the outdoor. And the outdoor has different kinds of balls. That Because some of them really um, kill. I mean, like they're not very bouncy. Yes. Mm-hmm. And we were playing one ones that had a little bit more bounce in it and then we played with this other and it was i was well excuse me i was accustomed to something else so i'm going back to the original but it's so much fun it we really had a great is time. Fun. it is really fun well good we really will have to get out and play sometime with you guys and 
we we haven't we haven't played together in a while. I mean, mostly because it's been winter, you know. So <laughs> now that it, we were we were talking about maybe this weekend is the weekend that we get out and kind of dust the paddles off and yeah try it. And I I am into pickleball like because us likes pickleball. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And so, but I've been surprised actually how much I do enjoy it, how fun it is, and Good. even though I'm really not coordinated with. Well, I don't believe that, but no. it is fun. It really isn't is fun. it. Yeah. So our main thing was. I mean, one, we just are intense. And together, we are so intense. It's exponentially intense. <laughs> and so, Jimmy's precious. I appreciate his leadership. Because then, too, he was recognizing, like, okay, he's got to help me get out of my brain. And he's got to help me get oh, me out too. of, like, all the... Well, you do well on Sabbath. Because then he can unplug a little easier because he's accustomed to that. He knows it's Sabbath. But for me, I feel like, oh, I want to take in all this information that I haven't had time of, to do mm-hmm. and I haven't had time to just totally, you know, just take in, and chew on it, mm-hmm. think about it, pray it all through, all the things that are probably not very Sabbath-y. Because <laughs> I believe the definition of a Sabbath is do what you don't do as a part of your job. Well, it's kind of refreshing to me. I kind of like mm-hmm. to hit that mode, but... There are other modes that we need and that are us, that our yeah. marriage needs. <laughs> we just needed to be able to do something that is fun, that's light, that isn't so serious. Yes. And so it's also just a great way to get outside and get some sunshine, which we were on those courts and it was hot, it was hot. Yeah. hot, hot, hot. Yeah. And so, yeah, ended up with sunburning my lips and, you know, Ugh. there we go. But it was awesome. <laughs> we love pickleball. Uh, that's awesome. And I just, I did make this note. It is pickleball, not cucumber ball. And I just want to add that as, <laughs> oh, a, as, a, a, as a note. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> it, this is true. Just saying. This is That true. is I guess true. the fun. Because nobody wants to play cucumber ball. But lots of people, the fastest growing sport is pickleball. That's pickleball. So <laughs> okay, really just funny. chalk it up then. Exactly. Add okay. that to your list. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Well, let's jump into today's question. So, Today's episode is a little bit different in that we have our question, but it's actually a question that came in several, has come in several times regarding a several sets of different circumstances. And so we're going to play our question, but then within that, we're going to kind of break it down into some specific examples for us to talk around regarding the main question relating back to that. So We'll ask the question, play the question, talk about that for a little bit, and then we'll break it down a little bit further with some specifics. Awesome. So we're answering bunches of questions. Bunches of questions. With one question. It is one that you asked for. It is. It is. Let's do this. (laughs) Here we go. I've been loosely monitoring recent news around Disney's changing LGBTQ policies, mostly because some of my friends and... That was last. That was last, last week. Question. I was like, that was oh, last this sounds question. very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was the same voice. What happened? What happened? Okay, hold on. Hold on. Y'all talk about something else among yourselves. <laughs> well, we're doing this live pod show. We are. <laughs> well, we could talk about, so what Daniel and I have been laughing so hard, like on the way, on the way to He's record still today. laughing. Oh, I can't, still wait. Laughing. I can't wait. So we both made protein shakes this morning to bring with us to work. In the same kind of cup. In the same kind of cup. My protein shake had. Uh, All the stuff. Everything. Lots of. Because I like my shake to be an experience. Yes. I'm not a utility eater. No. no. I'm a, oh, I like to enjoy. Yes. Even if it's a protein shake, I want to enjoy it. Which I appreciate about you. Thank you. I don't think of a shake as eating. <laughs> oh, my so gosh. I want it <laughs> to go Shake is not eating. <laughs> so There's no chewing. Therefore, there's no eating. <laughs> oh, my goodness. There could be swallowing. So it's just sustenance. Okay. It, it is. Or drinking. Yes. So I'm trying to drink it as quickly as possible with... Very specific things that I put in it. So this morning, I'm my shake has almond milk, peaches, some oats, some cinnamon, a little vanilla, and we so we blend it up. I that grab is it. Fancy. It's, it's yummy. Okay. Too. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so I take it, put it in one of the refrigerators at work, and it's. I mean, this was early in the morning. I mean, so like three hours later. Well, I, yeah. Keep okay. Going, no, keep you going. go. You go ahead. So, I also made a shake. <laughs> Powder and water. (laughs) Milk, protein powder, creatine, powdered greens. Okay. They look very different. They smell very different. A little different. Okay. (laughs) 
So, but when I went to put mine in the same fridge yours was, I thought I had left one there. So I was like, Who, what is that? Oh, no. And then I thought, oh, that's, that's Bree's shake. So I will not put my shake by her shake because I can see where this is going. So I go grab my shake, just get my shake, get my straw. But I'm like, wow, yes. this shake did not save well like it's brown like the vanilla shake is now turned. dark brown <laughs> it was white my peaches so like, turned brown <laughs> like, what happened? but i but i don't from there go to the next logical thought which mm-hmm. would be maybe something's wrong with this or maybe i should investigate further i'm just like oh well like shake it up <laughs> the experience has begun and you finished that experience <laughs> i just took no. a drink and was like this tastes funny. Like, wow, I should not pre-make my shakes like that. <laughs> it was in the fridge too long. It was in the fridge I should too do long. it fresh. I drank the whole thing. Oh. Like, choked it down because I was like, oh I have gosh. to drink this. I'm hungry. Like, oh I don't have time gosh. to do anything else. And we have very different hungry. amounts of protein yes. that we put in shakes. <laughs> so I'm just like. And is she putting in creatine or is that? <laughs> no, no. Oh, I didn't think no. so. Oh, and this was today? This was today. today. Oh. <laughs> This was not that long. How are you doing? <laughs> How are you doing over there? Like, so you can go run around the block. Yes. Do a few jumping jacks. Yes. <laughs> go play some pickleball. Go play some pickleball. So, I mean, I just choke that thing down and then I'm like, Ugh. like that was so gross. So then I'm like on my way here and Daniel's calling me and he's like, hey, you got the, I have your shake. Can I bring it to you? And I was like, no, I drank my shake. And he was like, <laughs> No, you didn't. No, <laughs> you drank my shake. I'll save your shake for tomorrow. <laughs> and then I was like, wow. So like backtracking that whole thing, I was like, I didn't even investigate that I had a white <laughs> shake this morning. And now it's <laughs> just like, like shake it up. Just I'm alert. Like powering it did not fit the paradigm, <laughs> but you were going to make it fit. <laughs> It's like, this is my shake. It doesn't this make sense shake. for it to be anything else. There's no reason why there would be nope. another nope. shake of the no same reason. container and type right next to my straw in this refrigerator. I love oh. it. <laughs> so you're feeling great. So, I'm Daniel, great. did you eat any smoothie? No, no. <laughs> you so have not starving. eaten. <laughs> Daniel's starving. I, I, I took my dad to lunch. It's his birthday today. So oh, that's awesome. Happy we birthday, went to eat. I, I'm not starving. We had a great lunch. Um, that was, so I'll get a shake. All right. Awesome. Thank you for joining us for more than you asked for today. We absolutely love creating these episodes for you. And hey, before you go, I just want to remind you that Trinity Fellowship Church is on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. The best way to keep up with what's going on at Trinity, including new podcast episodes, is by following us on your favorite platform. You can find our social media pages and other resources at tfc.org slash next. Well, I do have, I do have our questions okay. queued up now. Okay, let's play. Okay. Questions. Y'all ready? We're ready. Let's right, we go. go. Hey, Pastor Jimmy and Pastor Kim. How do I talk to my non-believer friends and family about why I live the Christian life without coming across as preachy, pretentious, or overly religious? Great oh, question. Oh, I love that mm-hmm. question. That's great. So wait, let's talk about just, let's talk about that for just a second and, and that, that question in general And just if there are some general approaches, you know, that we want to take when, when living the Christian life and wanting that for people, but also, um, we're talking about our, our friends and family. So Mm -hmm. not those who are necessarily the barista at the coffee shop or Mm -hmm. people that we just encounter, um, occasionally, but those who are really in our lives and our circles of influence, but who believe and live very differently than Mm -hmm our own beliefs and just the right approaches to take with them, you know, and wanting to love them, but also Mm -hmm. like we don't agree. And I want, I want something more for you. Mm -hmm. Um, someone I love. Well, I love it. I'm very thankful for the question. And I think something that is important is for us to always remember that we don't have to make any excuses for why we don't do things or why we don't live the way that other people do. And I think the best approach is, is, I mean, or an approach or something I think is important about the approach is that we love him because he first loved us. Right. And so, and that is like, we love God because he first loved us. Mm -hmm. So I think something that's always important is to maybe even just share a part of, this is who God's been to Mm -hmm. me. 
And because I know him in this way, I love him and my response, this is my response to his love for me. So it isn't something that is, oh, well, I'm going to choose to, it's not like, okay, I choose to play pickleball or, oh, no, I choose to play tennis. Oh, no, I choose to play racquetball or ping pong. You know, it isn't like a selection. So, okay, I'm going to decide to be a Christian, which I think sometimes people do see that that way of like, well, what it, where are you going to categorize yourself? How are you going to, who, who are the people that you're going to associate yourself with? Well, it's not so much about your social group that you're just trying to connect with. It is because I've had an encounter with the love of God. And now the way I'm living my life is my response to his love. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a big differentiation from that. I'm just going to follow a set of rules because then that's going to get old after a while. And that won't really bring an eternal transformation. But when we commit ourselves to that, well, this is the reason I'm living, why I'm li living this way is because God has loved me so much and has given me so much. And because he gives me so much hope that this is why, this is how, my, what my response looks like to him. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, one, one thing that's important, you know, you're think, talking about the idea of how do we evangelize our friends and family, right? Mm -hmm. Is kind of the, the gist of the question. And I think part of it is it has to start with prayer and it has to start with us praying for them and recognizing it is not our job to change them. The whole, that's the Holy Spirit's job. Yeah. So the Holy Spirit is actively involved in that process. You know, we say it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance and it's the process of Holy Spirit working in somebody's life that brings them into that place of understanding Jesus. So I, I think one of the most important things we can do is just love people right where they are. Now, that doesn't mean we have to accept aspects of their lifestyle or their choices that we would consider out of bounds for our Christian beliefs. Yeah. And uh, so I'm not talking about um, compromising our morals or compromising our belief system so that you know we can accept somebody, but we, we're supposed to love people and accept them where they are mm -hmm. and recognize, well, that's just where they are. You know, I think one of the things we often do um, maybe the wrong way as a Christian witness is, you know, we're not perfect, and um, and yet it's easy for us as Christians to criticize somebody else not being a Christian without acknowledging our own faults. You know, that's what Jesus said about, you know, how can you get the speck out of somebody else's eye when you got a plank in your own eye? First acknowledge the plank in your own eye. And so the, the moral of that story is to approach other people with a high degree of humility. In other words, this is I know what Jesus has done for me, and I know how Jesus has transformed me. And because of what Jesus has done for me and everything that he's overcome in my messed up life, I can have a lot of compassion and grace for where somebody else is. That's right. When we approach it from that perspective, we have way more opportunity to speak of the grace of God and the goodness of God than we do coming at it from the kind of the self-righteous, judgmental, you know, you're living your life wrong and, you know, headed down the wrong path sort of uh, yeah. sort of attitude. That, that, that doesn't work very well. Yeah, shaming never works. Yeah, yeah, shaming never works to get, not not in a good way. Never never works yeah. to get them into the, you know, to get them to accept Jesus. And I think the other mistake that we make a lot of times is we overemphasize Scripture. And mm -hmm. I love the Bible. I think the Bible is amazing. Of course, uh, we live our life by the Bible. It is the standard by which we uh, live our life. We read our Bibles every day, multiple times a day. I mean, it's it's a very important uh, tool and a resource for us. But if somebody is lost. If they haven't yet accepted Jesus, why would we expect them to believe in a book that they ha they don't have the basis for yet? Yeah. And so I think using scripture as a as a corrective mechanism doesn't work. Now, it may be that they are experiencing something in their life and you say, "You know what? The Bible says something about that." And they might go, "Oh, really?" You know. And so, you know, you we can introduce scripture in that context, but not just not just beating them over the head with scripture. You know, the scripture says what you're doing is bad and the way you're living is wrong and Mm -hmm. You know, that sort of thing that doesn't, uh, that doesn't help. That, that's not opening the door either. So I think, you know, being humble and, you know, one of the things that we learned when we were in young life, and I, I love this phrase, earn the right to be hurt. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's an aspect of serving and ministering to them in a way that gives us an opportunity. And then just be sensitive as, as if you're praying for them and you're praying for them to receive Holy Spirit's going to be moving in their life anyway. And as you are, are earning the right to be heard by serving and loving and accepting them, you know, what will happen is, is doors and windows will open to you mm -hmm. and, and they will come probably when you don't expect it. Yeah. You know, they, they might just ask a question like, Hey, 
man, y'all's marriage is just, y'all just seem different than y'all were last year. What's up? You know, all right, there's, there's now a, a window that has opened up to begin to share. Well, Hey, it's because we love Jesus. And then because of that, we work on our hearts and work on our lives and we're, you know, we engage and, and we go to things that help strengthen us and all of those things. And so uh, just, just looking for those opportunities, I think is really important. I love it. You guys are, are touching on in a great way, all of, you know, the, the very specific examples that, that some other of our listeners um, wrote in. And so let's jump into this first one, which is our son is living with his girlfriend. We don't agree with this lifestyle, but we want him to know we love him. How do we balance showing love to our child and at the same time, not showing support for the lifestyle? And of course, this example is our son is living with his girlfriend, but there are a myriad of examples that fall into this kind of lifestyle category, whether Mm -hmm. it be partying, um, or recreational drugs, hanging out with a bad group of friends, you know, homosexuality. I mean, all of all of those things can fit in this category. So let's talk about that one. Okay. <laughs> well, I really appreciate what you said earlier, honey, that first we have to pray. Mm-hmm. So I would always encourage everybody, don't ever just say, well, all we can do is pray. Because what I always think is that mm-hmm. anyone who says that does not understand the power That's of right. prayer. Mm-hmm. Because when we are praying to God, this is God who is... Uh, our Lord who created us. He spoke a word and creation came into existence. This is a God of limitless possibilities. This is our, this, this is a God who holds the universe in his hands in the span of his hands. So I think sometimes it's very important that we get perspective like, okay, when I am going to pray and I'm going to believe that God is moving on behalf of these that he loves. So it's not just that we love them. God loves them. Mm -hmm. We are God's creation with a created purpose. So a designer always creates his creation with a purpose or why would he have created them? So he loves every single one of, so we recognize too that as much as we love an individual or our children, like this question is um, referring to, he loves them even more. And that's always mm-hmm. brought a great comfort to me as a parent to know that he loves my children even more than I love them. And I am just ridiculously, passionately obsessed about loving my children. <laughs> I would even say, I read, read somewhere when the children were small, I read that um Growing your, um, loving your children, it causes them to grow to their maximum height and um, that children who grow with love grow taller, all these things. So I just prayed. It wasn't that I was trying to pray that I had tall children, mm-hmm. which they are they pretty are. tall. <laughs> yeah. But I just prayed. I said, Lord, I want to just pray and just love our children so much that they will grow to their full potential, even physically, that every area of their life will just be so full of love that they will be well nourished. When I think about how much I love my children, there's just nothing I wouldn't do for them to think God loves them even more than I love them. So I can trust that when I am praying to God about my children, or like this, these parents who are praying for their children who are in a difficult situation or a compromised situation that we know is not their very best, always remember to keep praying and that we're praying to the one who loves them even more. So God always has a redemption plan. So I would always encourage everyone do not give up. You keep this mindset and you keep your um, spirit nourished that this is why we've got to know what the word of God says. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have books on praying and blessing and speaking decrees over your children, your babies. And so when I don't know what to pray, I'm like, well, I'm glad I have my little book. I have got my little warrior bride arsenal. It's a lot of scriptures that I pray, speak out, and decree over our children, and I know that they're in alignment with what it is that God has for them. So all I would say is I'm like, there's there's no um, other alternative than for God to get them (laughs) and to bring redemption into their lives. So I would always encourage everybody, don't lose hope. Don't give up. There is not one single prayer that will go unanswered. It may be some time because there are other factors 
others. They get to make their own decisions. That, so we're not imposing our will, but we are definitely circling the wagons. We're releasing the power of the blood of Jesus. We're releasing prayers and decrees and life and opening up heaven so that they can have some reprieve to have an um, openness to the light and the truth of Jesus Christ. And his word will bring piercing to their hearts. So we're exactly right. We're going to love our children and we're going to pray for them. And it's not about being judgy. Um, and just depending on the relationship, depending upon the age, you know, there, there's going to be a little bit of a difference in how you're going to, um, what kind of um, role you will play in, as to whether mm -hmm. you come in and even say anything. If you've got children in your home like that, you can say a lot of things in that area. Um, be wise. Be, like, we're always going to be sure that we're filling their love bank, caring for them. And then, because it's not going to ever work if the only conversations that we are having are just negative right. or um, corrective, even maybe, if, yeah, maybe just corrective, even. Mm -hmm. So we've got to have some uh, some love in the love bank, shared experiences. This is parenting, right? right. Having all the shared experiences, but if, when they're older, then too, of just we're going to keep praying because we may our hands on or our conversations may be limited when they're in their adult years but we're going to keep praying. And I always pray that God will surround them with people who will um, bring them and encourage their relationship with God and that he will keep away all the other people who would be toxic and who would draw them away from God into something that would be more harmful or hurtful. So it's kind of a general. Yeah, yeah and I would add, add to that, and I love what you said there, babe. I would add to that when you're, as a parent, you, you would decide how much, um, where you are in your life's stage, you know? So in other words, obviously they're not at home, right? Right. But if as parents, if you're still supplementing income, you know, if you're still paying a car payment, if you're paying the rent payment, you know, if there's something that you're doing, well, that gives you a little more influence and you should feel more comfortable speaking into it more. In other words, if you're going to do that, I'm not paying for it. You know, you can yeah. say that as a parent, uh, but if they're on their own and they're independent and they're making their own choices, then truly you, you're in that place of praying as, as your primary resource. But I also think another thing that we can do is get our minds right about sin. And I, I think we miss the mark sometimes ourselves, which of course is what, what sinning is. It's missing the mark. But sometimes as Christians, what we recognize is sin is wrong. And the Bible tells us things that are sin. So we know sin is wrong. But sometimes we can have the wrong perspective on that because what we believe then is we know what the Bible says, so we know what's right and wrong, but sometimes we don't take the extra effort to know why. Mm -hmm. And and I want to specifically apply this to the couple of issues that you, you just touched on because when we understand why it's wrong, we understand God's, God's motivation behind it, it helps us approach the problem from a totally different angle. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's just, well, the Bible says it's wrong, you need to stop doing it. Well, that, that's not going to help somebody that doesn't believe in the Bible. They're, they're right, not, okay, they're not help gonna me out that. there just a little because, bit. Because let's be honest, they're living together. They're young. They're living together. You know, they're probably, the sex is probably good, and they're probably having a good time. So why would they, you know, and they right. both feel good with it. So you telling them that it's bad is not going to, yeah. not going to change their mind on the current lifestyle that they're living. And if they have no conviction, if, if they don't know why it's wrong, it's not going to help them. And so as Christians, if we can get, the, get in our minds, the understanding that when God wrote the Bible and he wrote things down, God didn't do anything because he was mean. He That's did everything right. because he loves us and he wants the best for us. Yes. So what he tells us is wrong is not wrong because it's, you know, it's something that would be fun for us that he's depriving us of. It's wrong because it's not to our best interest. There, there's something that is keeping us from having our best life, from having the best that we could have, you know, the, the best example I've ever heard of this is, you know, kind of the car manual, you know, I can get my, my truck and it came with a car manual that I never read, but let's just pretend like I read it and it was, I was important to yeah. me. Um, but there's things that I can do with my truck and things that I can't do with my truck. According to the manual, it's not because, you know, they just don't want me to have fun. They're like, Hey, if you go up a hill more steep than this, it's going to roll over and bad things are going to happen. Do not do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's because they know the creators of the truck know what's in the best interest of us uh, as we drive the truck. Same thing with the Bible. The Bible is there to give us the best history. So just this issue of living together. If we could understand 
the, the problem of living together, then it helps us to address what the real problem is. And the problem of living together is a man's greatest need is sex. A woman's greatest need is security. And so when the two come and they live together, what happens is, is the man's getting his need met freely without any cost. And the woman then is in a position of having to give that or she loses the security. Her security is constantly in question Mm -hmm. because there's no marriage commitment there. There's no covenant of marriage. There's no even marriage contract there. And so because of that relationship, it puts that uh, their their you or because of that dynamic, it puts their relationship in a strained position where they're never going to find the the joy and the fulfillment that they're looking for. Mm-hmm. Man, when we can approach the problem from that angle, we can say, "Look, let me just tell you, it's not that because you're, what you're doing is wrong. Yes, we think it's wrong, but it's wrong because of this. You're not going to get the best. You're not going to get the fullness. You're not going to get everything God wants you to get because you're." You're approaching it from the wrong angle. And that's not just what the Bible says. I mean, psychology says that. that you know, Daniel, you recommended a great book to me called Cheap Sex, which is a, a study from a professor at University of Texas, right? I yes. think he was a professor at University of Texas, a sociologist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a sociologist and was basically doing a study on this very issue and recognizing how the cost of sex, not necessarily dollars, he doesn't mean it that way, but in society, it's gotten so cheap, so easy and there's lots of reasons for that. It's a great book if you want to understand more about it, that it has created this dynam- relational dynamic where relationships are not nearly as fulfilling as they used to be, yeah. which just happens to coincide with what the Bible says. And, yeah. uh, and so when we, when we look at it and say, no, look, our issue behind this is because we want the best for you. And this path is going to lead you down somewhere that's not the best. It goes the same thing for you know doing drugs, yeah. abusing alcohol, all of those things. It may seem fun now, But there's, you know, it's causing harm. It's harming your body. It's causing you to make bad decisions. It's going to be hard to keep a job. You know, the, the, you know, it's the old salesman deal, right? We're going to sell the benefits, you know, not the features. We want to sell the benefits. And the benefits are when we do it God's way, we have the best chance of having a good life. Yeah, really good. And I think, I mean, if they're open to hearing us and if we have a good relationship, I mean, it just depends. I mean, sometimes there may be some, I appreciate that you're saying if we get to have that conversation with them, which of course is optimal. But or, or, or even if we don't have to have the conversation, mm-hmm. having that heart, approaching it yes. from that angle is what I, what I was thinking. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yes. No, I think that's great. Um, and, and so I would never give up on that. But I think what is important, like you're saying, is just our approach and mm-hmm. that I love you and I do want the very best for you. And this is what God wants. But I always want to pray in some other people. And it's okay. It takes a village. I used to just say, hey, it takes an army. (laughs) (laughs) I like that. For for some of our children. And I'm I'm thankful to be a part of other people's army or their village as well. So then if we can also look to see how can we help other people? Because there will be different Mm -hmm. times. I'm so grateful for the many people that God God has put in our children's lives that sure. at different times like y'all. they could have ears right to hear. <laughs> yeah, they could have ears to hear from someone else or a different voice. But mm-hmm. um, I, yeah, I think it's important then too when we put it that way. Now, maybe prior to getting to that point that maybe to prevent a decision while your children are younger, I heard something, the best definition that I've heard in maybe ever. And this was, uh, I've been listening to Mama Bear Apologetics mm-hmm. and it's Hillary Morgan Ferrer. Okay. And she, I'm just so impressed with her. It's mm-hmm. amazing information, great intellectual ammunition for and us. In fact, we maybe even note that, that. We can put that in the podcast yeah, notes so yeah. that people can so it's great. have access to that. So one of the things that she stated was she said that sex is a married couple repeating their marital vows in bodily form. Wow. And I thought that is perfect. So if we can train our children, you know, all appropriately in the right times Mm -hmm. that, oh, but sex is for married couples and they're repeating their marital vows in bodily form. This is the beauty of something that is wonderful and powerful that God created. And then we can recognize that when sex is classified in this way and our children have our kids, our teenagers, our college age um, children have this mindset, then we recognize that when sex is classified this way, sex out of marriage doesn't even make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Because Mm -hmm. if you haven't even made those marital vows, Mm -hmm. and I would always want to encourage, especially all of our women referring to what it was that you were stating, 
do not sell yourself short. That's right. Yeah. You have got great value. If a guy just wants to have sex with you and he is not willing to marry you, you need to get un- him out of your life because he is not the one for you. It is the one who respects you and values you and sees you as and your worth, who loves you and not just wants to marry you to have sex, but all the other reasons and is willing to spend time with you, to know you, to be sure that your love bank is filled, to know what it is that um, you enjoy, to know what your love language is, and wants to um, you know, take the time to know you, spend time with you, all those wonderful things. And, and of course, women doing that um, for your boyfriend or possible fiance and then future husband. And then you continue on in that. When they're willing to make an investment in you and then they want to marry you because you have got those same values with God at the center of your life, well, then you're going to have an amazing sex life and all the other benefits as Mm -hmm. well. But for women, don't sell yourselves short. And I would really encourage, um, I I mean, this is going to, I'm going to learn this and, and Really, I want to encourage parents to help their children have this understanding of sex. So that's why sex does not mm-hmm. make any sense yeah. outside of marriage. That's really good. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking about, too, the kind of our perspective on this right now comes from like the pre-marriage counseling that we do. Where Absolutely. a part of, I mean, as in one of our many, multiple sessions, actually, when we're doing pre-marriage counseling, we're talking about family and family dynamics. And so... We're, we're hearing from the kids about their, the dynamics with their family and their relationships with, with their parents and how, how, how they have navigated these kinds of things over the years. And I, I mean, you speak to that, of course, but it seems like um, the, the, the common thread um, that, that I think we hear is, and it's not even that they're able to articulate it necessarily, but that when parents are like navigating these situations, thinking about the long term of their relationship with their kids versus like in, in the, the long game of the relationship versus the like kind of the the flare ups that can happen, right. you know, and, yeah. and, and coming down hard on those, but yeah. thinking long term and what yeah. kind of relationship do I want to have with my kid? It's been, um, it's been really sweet to see that, you know, that times when it's tough with a teenager, you know, to come back around and those, the parent and the, and the grown adult child now have a great relationship because they've, they've navigated these things with the, with the long-term relationship in mind. What do you? No, absolutely. The, the, there's a willingness to, well, as a, as the child kids they're not kids when they're in our living room they're adults some of them in this mm-hmm. room right now <laughs> <laughs> and uh to see them become adults with their parents and then start to navigate these things and and see the the as kids getting to see and starting to live oh my parents made great sacrifices for me and they made decisions and they're not perfect but they did the best they could with hearing God and raising us. And that's where we are at now as we're preparing to be married and make these decisions and these values. And so there's this real, when there's that long term term vision for the relationship, the, the, I guess the view or vision to see like, okay, I so appreciate what God has done through my parents with me. And I hear them now as I step into adulthood, listening to them, but also, um, kind of growing into a new relationship that kind of changes the conversation a little bit but now we're adults mm-hmm. together mm-hmm. and even now i mean I, I i mentioned i had dinner with my dad because it's his birthday and got to celebrate him there's still times even at lunch day where i'm like hey i know you're not telling me how to do this part of my life but what do you think about mm-hmm this i could you are a good son i could use some help dad (laughs) (laughs) and he's like i don't know i don't know i think he called me once he was like do you think i should buy this car and i was like that's i don't know that i'm the guy to ask dad (laughs) but sure we can have this conversation so that just building that that rapport and the the um what you mentioned that phrase you said about young life is really really good earning the right to be heard yeah right and 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 seeing that come to fruition in Young young people, kind of what you're saying through, pretty yeah. much. 
And I, and I know what you're not saying, but I want to say it so that we know what we're not saying. Yeah. We're not saying that as we're raising children, we're trying to be their friend. Right. No. So when, we, no. when we're saying we have a long-term view, but we're still parenting. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're still actively parenting through all the phases, knowing that we're hopeful for something something else in the, yes. in the long term. Yeah. Because we, we want what's best for them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of times during some of the rougher parts of, mm-hmm. of adolescence, um, there's a there's going to be some some struggles there. We're, what our kids need is for us to love them enough to yes. to put a boundary. Yes. Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. and it's really important. I love that you clarified that too. I, I think we were all on the same page. We always want to be sure that we're mm-hmm. clear on something like that. But when we're training our children, I keep hearing these phrases. They're like, "Oh, well, your children will show you when they're ready. Your children will tell you what they want. Your children will tell you what they need." So I think there's an element of that that, well, okay, well, they're hungry. Great. They need to be fed. That is legitimate. But you as the parent can help define when it, what their schedule is so that they mm-hmm. can balance that, that you know, oh, okay, you're two years old. You shouldn't be eating, wanting to eat at two o'clock in the morning, yeah. you know? <laughs> so how do they not know to do that? Mm-hmm. Parents train that. So yes. I think that's one of the things that's important that is a little bit counterculture is that you are the parent yeah. and you are not there to just um, follow along with what your children think they want to do at the moment right. and just say, well, they will, they will lead you and they will show you. It's like, wait. They are two. Their brains are not developed, or even mm-hmm. babies, their brains are not developed. Mm-hmm. Your brain doesn't develop fully developed until you're in your like mid twenties or mm-hmm. so. I'm not yeah. sure I've ever gotten that. <laughs> but. but you don't need parenting. <laughs> so <laughs> th- that's the part is that as parents, like parents, let's be bold enough to be parents. Yes. And it doesn't mean again that we're trying to you may be the authority, we may be the authority in our children's lives, but it doesn't mean we have a heavy handed authoritative approach right Right. yeah and it also doesn't mean that okay well we'll just see whatever he wants to do if he wants to do Mm -hmm. it no um you we are there with the parents with the developed brain or more advanced brain we are there as the adult to help guide our children into healthy patterns into healthy sleep patterns healthy eating patterns into um, healthy social development and not just doing whatever it is that we think that we feel like doing Mm -hmm. in the moment i love that you say it that way because even just realizing the the growth of perspective that children have as and as children become adults that there's still the growth in perspective and what i mean by that we were in the car with sex and our four-year-old just the other day and, and she was asking, I bu- love a good Saxon story. <laughs> she, was, she was asking a bunch of questions about Jesus. And, and she was like, y'all went to Israel. Oh, did y'all meet these different people from the Bible? And, oh. and I said, Oh, well, no, they, they're not alive. And she goes, what? Oh. And, and I said, well, they got old and they died. And she goes, what? And I said, that was over 2000 <laughs> years ago. And she goes, what? <laughs> <laughs> so it just dawned on me like, Oh, of course. Oh, you don't have the perspective that the stories <laughs> we've been saying great. are thousands of years old. <laughs> yeah. You thought that was like we could go to Israel and meet those yes. people. I mean, I think she even asked if we could meet the people who killed Jesus and she beat them up. Yeah. Yes. That was, that Come was on, a- Saxon. <laughs> Let's go deal with it. Let's set the record straight. I love that it. is awesome. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's how really cute. Good. That is great. So that point being... From her little perspective, yes. it doesn't mean anything's wrong or broken with right. her. It means that she is forming. She's in her yes. formative yes. years. So therefore, she's dependent upon her parents, parents. to lead her into what is what would be healthy a healthy reality Absolutely. for her. Yes. Wow, that's good. I love it. Hi there. We're Kim and Jimmy Witcher, pastors at Trinity Fellowship Church. Yes, and every other week we sit down and answer one of your questions on our podcast, More Than You Ask For. So if you have something you'd like to ask us, we would love to hear it. Just email us at podcast at tfc.org. Yeah, we're excited to hear from you. All right, let's move into this uh, second second specific. Yeah, you go ahead. My brother doesn't believe in the Bible. He's very logical. He likes to debate, and he is very smart. He likes talking to me about what I believe, but I don't feel like I can build a case to convince him. 
I care about his salvation, but I feel like I always lose the debate. What do I do? Well, that's a great, great question. And, and I think that gets to two things. Mm-hmm. One is you're, you're, trying to, you're trying to start with the Bible. So mm-hmm. that that's, can be a hard challenge, but I've got some suggestions for you there. Cool. Uh, but that can be a hard challenge. You know, one, one of the things that we found as uh, recently we're putting together this, this discipleship app and some things we're doing, and, and the approach has been fascinating to me. And it's a, it's a way to approach anyone, but certainly I think it's, it's a way for intellectual people to get their heads wrapped around the issues of, of God. And I think sometimes God's easier to get to first than the Bible. Yeah. And so if we start from God, you can, you can start from some ways like this. You know, there, there's the idea of intelligent design, which you can Google that and find out more about, but it's just the recognition that, you know, if you look at the, the odds of us existing are unbelievable. You know, so right. it's just it's just to be an atheist is really almost impossible because to to just look at literally look at the facts and realize that, you know, if the earth was any closer to the sun or any farther away from the sun, life wouldn't exist. If Jupiter was not as big as it was and as close to us as it is, the earth wasn't wouldn't exist. I mean, you can just go on and on and on and on and on about all the you know, if we didn't have a moon you know, the earth would be too compressed and we, you know, life would probably not exist. I mean, there's so many things and the odds of it being an accident are just unbelievable. It's, it's just yeah. almost impossible to wrap your head around. So that's a great ap- approach to take uh, when you're thinking of that. And that leads us through, you know, there's kind of a little, a little path that we've been uh, in this digital discipleship that we've been leading people along. And it's asking this question and it, and it would be this, do you think there's a creator? You know, and most people, if you, again, if you get your head around some of that intelligence, well, they're, yeah, probably. I mean, you know, may, maybe not God, maybe certainly not God the Father, maybe not certainly God the Father that we can pray to and is interested in my daily life, but there could be a creator. Like, okay, so do you think you were created? Yeah, I think I was created. Do you think the creator made you on purpose? Yeah. Do you think you have a purpose in this life? Is there a reason that you're here? And most people would answer that question, Yeah. Now, you, you don't have to define what that reason is, but you need to ask the source of that reason. Mm-hmm. If there's a reason that you exist, wh- wh- where did that come from? And mm-hmm. what is the root of the reason you exist? Well, the, the, really the logical answer is there's a creator who created you on purpose and gave you a purpose, and he knows the reason you existed. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I would like to talk to him about that, you know, and then, and now, and now you're, now you're going down a path, you know, a a lot of really intelligent people have been saved by an an understanding of moral law Mm -hmm. and, uh, and moral law is the law that is in all of humanity. So if you look across humanity, whether you know, you know, Christian, non-Christian, whatever, and, and really, if you just look at children, you can see moral law at play. So you put two kids in a playground and, and they start playing and they're, you know, playing with a toy or whatever. At one point, you're going to hear one of the children say to the other, it's my turn, you know, mm-hmm. and well, how do they know it's their turn? I mean, what, who, who defines that it's supposed to be my turn? Well, it's because there is a, there's a baked in inside every one of us. There's a moral law that we know right and wrong. We know fair, you know, you've had it. Now it's my turn. Yeah. Uh, we know that murder is wrong. You know, you don't have to be a Christian to know that murder is wrong. Mm-hmm. Generally, nobody likes to be cheeky. Cheated on. Nobody right. likes to be cheated. Nobody, mm-hmm. nobody believes that lying is okay. You know, I mean, we, we, you know, joke around and call them little white lies. You know, it's a little okay to lie a little bit, but we all know it's wrong. You know, it, Christian, non-Christian, you know, it's wrong. Uh, uh, cheating on your spouse. We all know that's wrong. How do you know, how do we know that's wrong if we're not following some sort of a, a yeah. code? And that's the moral code. And so if there's a moral code, then there has to be a creator that created that moral code because that's intelligent design. I mean, something intelligent had to create that and yeah. put that in humanity. So that's a, that's a path uh, for walking down and, and helping some of those intellectuals, you know, face the real reality of, well, if I have a purpose, there must've been a creator that gave it to me. Mm. Yeah. And just to go along with exactly what it is that you're talking about then honey was that I came across this new term called teleology I love this Ooh, and I so what it means is that any a designer creates something for a specific purpose okay so it could be that a designer has created this microphone for a specific purpose to take sound and to amplify and record it so um 
the same thing with us as for anything that has been created, there's a purpose for it. You can look around at anything. Why are, why do we have these chairs? Well, because these were made for people who are sitting at a desk and you need some lower back support, right? (laughs) Right. So there's a designer who created this chair with the purpose for greater comfort for the one who's sitting in it. They can, we can sit here a little bit longer with greater comfort. The same idea with this teleology is that we have a designer, a creator who has created us. Why would he create us if he did not have a purpose um, or a function for us to fulfill Mm. so if we're created because we're all here and i i can look at you i can see you there then we have a purpose Mm. to fulfill so Mm. then let's ask the creator and see if he can tell us what that purpose is and that and that leads us into a pursuit of god which then kind of takes you down the path towards evangelism it's like okay well how do you get close to god well we need to acknowledge that we've broken some of his moral laws and we failed somewhere along the way. And if he's a just God and then, you know, leads us to Jesus and then on down, on down the road. So I, th- I think or that's a good way yeah, of approaching or even that. being willing to just talk to him. Well, if you believe there's a creator somewhere out there, you know, if, if it doesn't even matter if it, he seems like maybe they seem as like a force or something, which, you know, he isn't, he's God, but however they want to see him as we're beginning a journey, Jesus will meet them wherever they are, and he will begin to give greater revelation and understanding. There's more of Jesus to discover, and I love that because we're all in a process of discovering him. So they're just in the um, early phases of discovering who Jesus is, and so it may not align yet with who we know him to be because they just it's still a little bit dark and gray in that space. It's still a little fuzzy. Well, that's okay. Jesus will meet them right there. And because he is truth and because he is real, we can always even just say, well, hey, well, why don't you just maybe ask him then, talk to him, say, well, creator, then what is my purpose? If you mm-hmm. designed me here, then what is my purpose? What did you make me for? Yeah. And, and uh, you know, mm-hmm. this is going to be controversial, what I'm about to say. So I'm saying Ooh. that disclaimer up front. Okay. <laughs> you know, I think sometimes too, as as Christians, we put too much emphasis on that moment of praying the prayer, mm. you know, and, and especially when you realize, I think the, that prayer came around like in 1912, that's not about right, Daniel, so something like that, 1912, 1920. So it's right in there. Yeah. Um, and so for thousands of years, people were getting saved without praying the prayer, that's you right. know, and so the prayer is a relatively modern uh, perspective. And so I think what's important about that is salvation is a journey. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you mm-hmm. think about, well, think about y'all's relationship, right? Yeah. Y'all are married. When did you fall in love, right? How did you know? What was the moment, you know, where you knew that you were in love? You know, I mean, it's, yeah. th- those are difficult things right. to yes. define. Mm-hmm. Why? Because it's a journey. It's a relationship. It's a process. It's more organic than that instant. Now, there might have been a moment of attraction. You know, Kim and I would say we were in love at first sight because we, we, there was definitely something uh, when we saw each other that our hearts both jumped and we, and we wanted to pursue one another. But, you know, the love that we have now is nothing like what we had then. I mean, it's totally in a whole different level of maturity. So recognizing that it's a journey kind of gets us off the hook of thinking we got to close the sale. You know, we got we got to get them to the prayer. We got to push for this thing. So just Mm kind of let let it go and let let Holy Spirit do his thing and and we can engage with them along the way. I did want to circle back to the Bible, though. Mm -hmm. And there's some great resources out there for you on the Bible. And, And one of the ones to realize is to recognize, you know, we don't, especially of the New Testament, really the New Testament and the Old Testament, we don't have any of the original manuscripts. Mm-hmm. All we have is copies. Mm-hmm. But we have hundreds of thousands of copies and fragments of copies. And it's, uh, I think we just did, do you remember the, the data? We were just looking this up. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you thinking, I know Daniel. If anybody's going to have it, <laughs> no, it's going to be I Daniel don't. on the tip of his tongue. But it's something like, it's something like there's 900,000 pieces of, of documentation for the Bible but yet the next closest is like Homer's Iliad, I believe. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think there's like 5,000. Yes, almost none compared to. Yeah, almost none compared to. And so just recognizing that you go back into human history, we have this reproduced text on an unbelievable scale with unbelievable accuracy mm-hmm. um, over thousands of years. And you know, one of my favorites is when they got the, uh, is it Qumran Caves? You know, the yes. Dead Sea Scrolls, I think it's the Qumran mm-hmm. Caves. They were found in like I think it's 1947. The the they pulled out a book of Isaiah that was I think it was 
200 years old. Wow. Um, and it almost matched perfectly with our current book of Isaiah. Wow. You know, there was a couple of differences, you know, spelling and, and a few things like that. But for the most part, it was almost exact. And, and Isaiah was written, I think, in 700 B.C. Wow. And, uh, and so it was a 500-year-old copy that we found 200 years later, and it, it matched almost exactly. So you th- see things like that, and you're like, okay, this book is unique. Mm-hmm. This, this, this doesn't happen with any other, uh, any other uh, piece of literature. It's really good. Well, I think something that I thought was interesting in this question was, I feel like I always lose the debate and that's where I'm I'm appreciating the questions that you brought in the beginning, because to try and debate back with someone who is building a case has got it all thought out and you don't necessarily think that way. Meaning, and I'm, I'm even using, you know, our marriage as an example here is that as Daniel and I were growing in our marriage relationship and we're like having some pretty significant, you know, knockdown drag outs in the beginning. And it was mostly centered around, I felt like he has a case for everything. Like he has thought through it all. Like he's got data to back it up. If like, I haven't thought through it, I'm going to pretend like I haven't. I'm going to build a case. <laughs> it's going to be ironclad. And by the way, you're wrong. Yes. <laughs> yes. This sounds very familiar. I know, I know this game. Oh. We played this game. Yes. And I'm you just... Know, it's pretty destructive. It's not that's a not fun gonna, game. That's not going to help a marriage. It's not no, a fun game. No. And I'm going, all I have is feelings. Like, I just, I just, I have lots of feelings and I don't know how to put my feelings with your, with your case. And so I love your suggestion of a different approach that yeah. you don't like coming at a debate with a, with a, with a debate completely misses um, even the relational aspect of getting to know um, getting to know the the heart of God, the ultimate that can that you can't really build a case around. You know, mm-hmm. it's not that the relationship with God. It's hard to you know, um, it's hard to make that scientific. But coming at a, a different approach and asking, you know, do you believe there's a creator? Like that, it it can unlock a different part of their heart that has yet to be explored. Well, yeah, the, the really beautiful thing about God, if He's the Lord over all then he is the Lord over information and research, which you've given tons of great Mm -hmm. resources to. He's also the Lord of our heart. And so I love the question you've imposed in in service this weekend. Who came to Jesus because you thought through it? Right. I I came. There may be thinking that leads you there, but then the faith step, he, I'm going to make him Lord and savior. There is a, a, a spiritual connection. And then it involves emotions. It involves it does. It does involve a, your will and, mm-hmm. and the decision. So the mm-hmm. f- all all parts of you. And when I think about how I've interacted with different people, kind of like this person's brother, a lot of times that other approach is talking about. Okay, well, here's what I've seen God do. Here's what He's done in my life. I've seen. Sh- she just prayed in Polish, and she doesn't know Polish. Right. But that that's how she heard her. So I, we can talk about the facts. That's the facts of the story. I don't know how that happens without God. Right. Mm-hmm. So they're kind of taking the other approach about how Holy Spirit transforms us can can really win us through our hearts, especially, and Bree mentioned, you know, our early part of marriage. A lot of that was a defense mechanism, right? That was Oh, me, for sure. Me defending myself, but then once... I'm not saying oh, for sure for you. I was saying for <laughs> no, For sure. I was saying for me. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. <laughs> well, it is... It's a general thing, right? Yeah. So yes. it's where you're going, so go mm-hmm. ahead. So that. so, so that, that other approach sometimes just involves earning the right to be heard about how... That's what you think. How do you feel about your life? What's going on in your life? Yeah. What, what, what things are worth processing? And, mm-hmm. and as you earn that right to be heard, when... When I've been asked, okay, so why aren't you anxious about, why aren't you dealing with depression and COVID right now? Why aren't you, well, I'll tell you why. Right. This is who Jesus is. This is who God is in my life. This is who the Holy Spirit is leading me right now. So we can, we can continue to debate facts. That's what's true. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think you also, what you're, what you bring up too, Daniel, is the idea of what we're selling is a relationship. Yes. Yeah. And, and I think that's another thing that's important. We're not selling you know, I, I do think it's helpful in, to some people really are saved because they don't want to go to hell. So, I mean, there really yeah. is, you know, but that's probably, I don't know, less than 10% probably of, of people that get saved. The, the most 
reason or the most common reason is because I want to have a relationship with God. Yes. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking for something. I'm looking for this relationship. So selling the relationship instead of selling what's wrong and the problems is a, is a much better sell. And, and one thing that you're touching on too, if you think about it, even this is an old salesman kind of perspective. Um, a question is a, a well phrased question is infinitely more powerful than a well phrased statement. And, and the reason for that is, is truly psychological. No. Yes. Mm-hmm. It has to do with your brain, whichever one that is. That yes. would be that. That would be it, psychological. <laughs> and it's because of this. We process information in our frontal lobe, but we make decisions based on our emotions, hmm. which is why we always say things like this. Why, why didn't you do that? I just didn't feel right about it. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, well, why'd you make, well, I just felt, it felt right. It felt like the right thing we we're supposed to do. You know I mean? We, we describe decisions we've made with feeling language. And so when you ask somebody a question and it gives them something to ponder on, it actually goes past just the, the fact and the information and it gets them down into their, into their emotions and where, where our decision maker is. Love it. Well, I do appreciate even as you're talking about that defense mechanism, that is sometimes people who just want to approach everything in a debate format or in a logical intellectual format that, that is, it's like, well, it's the defense mechanism. Why so defensive? Why so cynical? Mm -hmm. Well, then that's where to begin to ask the Lord, okay, Lord, if I know Holy Spirit and I know, show me where, um, show me what it is in them that they need to hear to unlock their heart. And we can ask Holy Spirit because he knows them. What's the word of knowledge? What's the word of wisdom? And that takes a little bit more effort. So I'm not at all um, negating that we need to be wise and have some good intelligence on, okay, what is a wise approach? What does history say about Jesus? Do you know that from my personal experience, I never had to, I mean, I'm like Saxon. <laughs> I was just raised in church. It's like, oh, this is what I knew. This is what I believed. I never had to, th- for me, I never questioned well, did he really walk on the earth? Well, when was that? How do we know that? We need. How do I get that proof? Yeah. So I do think some of those questions are good for us to grow in and just to continue learning. But don't just get tripped up in that. Remember that we have got Holy Spirit to ask him and he will lead us and he will guide us into victory. And he loves them more than yes. we love them. Mm-hmm. So we can ask him, Holy Spirit, we just ask for your spirit of truth to penetrate their heart and minister to their area of brokenness. Where wh- What is it that's put, caused them to have such a guard up mm-hmm. and such a protective? Where did they get disappointed? Where did they get hurt? You know, maybe it's just they just gave up on life or gave up on believing for things because they had a series of things that they believed in. Maybe it was, you know, a broken home, parents getting divorced, you know, a, yeah. a beloved, a loved one dying when mm-hmm. they didn't understand that. So they're just going to decide, okay, well, then I'm not going to believe in God because th- these things were too hurtful in my life. Yeah. So if God, if we pray, God can minister to that area of their heart. Yeah. And it's not so much about just trying to get them to believe in God. It's about, okay, Lord, how do we minister to their need? What do you want to do? And how can you, and I'm here, how do you want to use me to be able to minister that? And whatever it is that he has you do or say or speak or whatever, we can at least always pray. Yeah. And that is powerful. All right, we have one final segment or, or situations and circumstance to talk about. So this one says, I'm in college. How do I approach assignments that are conflicting with my biblical worldview? Oh, awesome. Well, you stand. And, you know, there are more and more the need and the opportunity to stand against those things is so important. Now, it's going to depend on, you know, what the issue is and how you stand against it and what the righteous way is. But you just stand. Uh, we have rights. We have rights under the Constitution. We have rights um, under, you know, the Bill of Rights, freedom of expression of our religion. And, you know, uh, I just wrote a thought piece uh, on yeah. separation of church and state. And one of the things that I talk about in there is, I mean, even in the workplace, um, the, you know, the EEOC has very specific accommodations that were employers have to make for religious beliefs. You know, if you mm-hmm. have times of prayer or if there's activities you're not going to do. And so, I mean, employers are forced to do that and it's a very broad application. And so when you, when you realize that if a, if a professor is asking you to do an assignment 
that truly violates your religious beliefs. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got to do something uh, that you don't believe in. You've got to try to justify something you don't believe in. You're well within your rights to just say on on beh- on, on basis of my conscience. And this is the this is the wording that I would encourage you to use. Mm-hmm. On basis of my conscience, based upon my religious beliefs, I cannot go forward and do this. Okay. And if they want to make you go to the dean, and if that doesn't work, keep going up the uh, keep going up the chain and be respectful. But yeah, stand against those things and say no, I'm not, I'm not doing it. And and no, you're you're probably going to face persecution for it. It's just the reality of the world we live in. But here's what I promise you: if you'll stand up, Jesus will stand with you. That's yeah. really good. Amen. I okay. love that. No. Me too. That was really Absolutely. good. Absolutely. Okay. I would just always encourage you keep standing. <laughs> That's right. And if you are truly convicted of something, so you're. this is a day and time that there's no gray space. That gray space is really shrinking very quickly. Know what it is that you believe. And yeah. if you truly believe it, then... You keep believing what it is that God has placed on your heart that you know is truth and don't let that be violated and be willing to, I appreciate what you said there, hon, be willing to just recognize, is this, am I okay with being persecuted over this? Mm -hmm. What if a teacher fails me? And then you think about it. Well, what if, what if you get kicked out of a university Well, what if, Mm -hmm. I mean, many people have made statements about our whole department of education or, you know, needing to be, um, you know, refurbished (laughs) Refurbished. (laughs) Refurbished. or the whole purpose of what is happening in our universities. Mm -hmm. So there are other things and God has got you. And just as you said, Jesus will stand with you. He will lead you. If you hold on to him, the Bible promises us Mm -hmm. that he will lead us into victory. So I'm going to hold on to Jesus and I'm going to let him take the lead and I'm going to follow him. And the Bible is very clear about saying, if you you're ash- if we're ashamed of Jesus, he'll be ashamed of us. But if we're not ashamed of Jesus, that he's not going to be ashamed of us. And he has totally got us covered. I just want to just add just like, yes, don't <laughs> you allow yourself to be intimidated. Yeah. Be honoring and respectful, but do stand. Mm-hmm. Don't be complacent and don't compromise. So good. Yeah. And as, as we're processing this, I've got one more thing I'd like to say on this yeah, whole subject, if that's like, a, you mm-hmm. know, one more yeah. just kind of perspective, because I know there's a lot of people that, that you're praying for a loved one and you maybe have been praying for a long time and you're just not sure if you've seen that breakthrough and, and you might get discouraged. And I just want to encourage you with this. You know, Jesus was with his disciples. We don't know how long, but probably it was somewhere between 18 and 24 months before we get to Matthew 16. Mm-hmm. And Matthew 16 is where Jesus takes you know his 12 up to Caesarea Philippi, and they're sitting around, and he says, who do the people say that I am? You know, And they're saying, some say Elijah, some say Moses, whatever, whatever, John the Baptist. And he says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus you know, basically freaks out. Like, oh my gosh, you got it. You, know, you finally yeah. got it. And, uh, and so you think about that. They'd been with Jesus right. for... 18 to 24 months. Hmm. And they'd seen the miracles. They were firsthand witnesses to all the miracles. They, they'd experienced miracles themselves. And it took them 18 to 24 months to figure out who he is. And hmm. so, you know, if living with Jesus while he's on the earth can take you 18 to 24 months to fully believe in who he is, my goodness, let's give, there's plenty of room uh, yeah. for, for all of us. And, uh, and there's plenty of opportunity there because God. God's love is so great. His his expression is so broad. His kindness is so unbelievable. And uh, there's still an opportunity for them to get saved. And, and Jesus did everything. I mean, God went to the ends of the earth, literally, that we might get saved, and he's not given up. That's awesome. Well, what a great conversation today. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Thank you all. I'm not even hot or giggly. <laughs> <laughs> well, my arm's right? not asleep. So Your arm's not asleep. <laughs> it's a win all around. Awesome. <laughs> Next time, wear a black shirt, would you? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> this is not going to do it. <laughs>